Academy of Sciences for having us and all of you that are going to listen today. Um, Peter and I hope to share with you some of our experiences digitizing museum collections. Uh, and while we've been working for um, Pictura doing that, uh, it's a digitization and software company. So um, Alejandra already introduced me a bit. I'm based in Washington, DC, uh, where I support our local team that works at the Smithsonian on a botany project. Uh, I also work with our teams in New York in the Netherlands and Australia. And maybe Peter, you can give yourself a little bit of an introduction. Sure, uh, I'm Peter and uh, I'm based in New York, although I work at the Picture A studio in Jersey City. And in there, we have a bunch of digitization equipment uh, projects come into us sometimes, in addition to us going on location um, at institutions. So um, I tend to manage the day-to-day -day goings on and digitization of the projects in Jersey City. Yeah, so uh, today I'm gonna give a, a broad overview of who Pictura is, uh, what we do and how we do it, followed by a deeper dive with Peter afterwards with some uh, examples of ongoing projects and projects we've done in the past for different institutions. Uh, so at the end, uh, there should be time for, for questions uh, and to open up any sort of conversation uh, if any of you want to, uh, to ask us anything. Um, before I start, I did want to mention that last week I tuned into New York Botanic Gardens webinar. Um, it was run by Barbara Tears and she was um, talking about her new publication. Uh, it's called Herbarium, The Quest to Preserve and Classify the World's Plants. Uh, she included a really nice section on the pioneers of California herbaria, and she also highlighted the story of how Alice Eastwood saved the botanical type specimens of your collection before the original building was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting. I, I actually got the book and I started reading it, but um, I hope that you know today's today's presentation for you can can show you that. Uh, the thing that we do, mass digitization uh, for entire collections and museums is possible right now today. And it can provide you the tools that help preserve collections in ways that live on beyond the physical archive uh, and help connect communities of scientists, educators, students, and the public all around the world. So um, let's begin with the, the big question, who is Pictura? Uh, so we're a global digitization service provider that works with both public and private institutions to make cultural heritage and natural history collections digitally accessible for scientific research and public access. We deliver high-end mass digitization solutions, both on and off site from our partners and work with them every step of the way from project development and logistics to project execution and online publishing. Uh, so what types of collections do we work with? Uh, we design workflows to rapidly create images of biological specimens, including dried plants, microscopic slides, and pinned insects. Uh, along with those, we also digitize a variety of associated archival formats, like ledgers, photographs, maps, uh, field notebooks, um, other things like that that give context to your collections and provide a lot of foundational um, information for, for specimens. Uh, so just like research methods and technologies that are used by institutions like CIS, um, we, we continue over time to develop our solutions um, and make new pieces of equipment. We learn from past projects. Um, and I, I think a really good example of that is um, since, since 2014, we've progressively designed and implemented three different conveyor systems that can digitize herbarium sheets. Uh, they can also digitize archival photographs and documents, and most recently, um, pinned insects. So if today we don't highlight a specific type of collection that you're interested in digitizing, we'd love to hear more from you about the collections you hope to take online, uh, because we often pioneer new digitization workflows alongside institutions as they invest in collections preservation. It's also entirely possible that some of our current workflows would need relatively minor adjustments to suit your collection's imaging needs. Um, but in the end, the goal of all of our projects is to make collections digitally accessible. Uh, so now that you know what we do, let's dive into a little bit about how we do that. Uh, although every collection is unique, you can organize any project into three phases of what we call the digitization journey. 
and those are pre-digitization, digitization, and post-digitization. Today, I'm going to be focusing on some of the different types of equipment that we use to um, digitize different types of museum collections. Um, before I do that, I'll give a brief run through of the pre-digitization phase uh, on this slide. So um, digitizing your collection is not as easy as setting up a camera and taking photos. Uh, the time period before digitizing is critical because it allows our teams to work closely with curators and staff to establish groundwork, um, project timelines, protocols for handling and image quality, and also outline the major goals of your project. The goal of preparation uh, is as simple as it sounds. To make uh, your collection ready for digitization, we learn all about your collection, how it's curated, some of the irregularities, and establish how we can step off on the right foot together. Uh, that phase requires work by both you and us. Uh, a good example, some folders may need to be barcoded to create a logical hierarchy when we're digitizing uh, your actual collection, and also after the fact when you put that into your database. This planning allows us to be efficient during project execution. Uh, next, we plan the logistics of moving your collection during the transportation phase. A project can happen in one of two places, on-site at your facility or at an off-site studio. Where we digitize your collection will be uh, dictated by your available space and your needs and wishes. Uh, regardless of uh, where your collection is imaged, we always handle collections with great care. We've worked with thousands of institutions and take the many uh, object handling guidelines we've used very seriously. Uh, before any material ever is moved by our team, we determine uh, proper handling protocols that's right for your collection. Uh, and finally, the installation phase, uh, that's managed by our team of experts who will transport all the equipment uh, to your studio site. They'll install it, test it, uh, train all of our staff members who will be working on the project. Uh, and the goal of this is to make sure all of our equipment is ready for production and all quality standards are established. Uh, on the next slides, we'll dive deeper into the digitization and um, post-digitization phases of the project. Uh, so here on this slide, you can see there's a number of images that show some of our equipment and some of the types of materials that we frequently work with. Uh, these include conveyors, stationary systems, and traditional object photography for larger or bulkier 3D items. Uh, in the center, you'll see a diagram of a conveyor uh, directly below that is a tabletop system that's used for archival materials like photographs. Uh, to the left and right, you'll see a herbarium specimen and an entomological specimen. And then above that, you'll see some uh, photographic slides and also a glass slide up there in the left-hand corner. Uh, so let's take a look at some of our equipment, starting with conveyors. Uh, our conveyors all started in 2014 when we designed and built our first herbarium conveyor for the Naturalis Biodiversity Center in the Netherlands. Since then, we've managed to digitize more than 15 million specimens at more than 50 institutions, including the Smithsonian. Uh, on our conveyor, we disassemble your collection, we'll add barcodes, we'll capture all the folders and all the specimens. Uh, we can do this at a rate of 4,000 images per day and uh, which means it only takes a matter of months or years to actually complete a project, uh, which is one of the, the main things that sets us apart from a lot of other, um, I guess, organizations that do this type of work, or even um, when uh, organizations like the National Science Foundation um, give funding and plan out these types of projects. Um, in February, we're actually starting our newest herbarium project at the National Arboretum in Washington, D.C., and there we're going to digitize 800,000 specimens over the course of one year. Uh, then in the middle, in 2018, we designed and launched a second conveyor that can digitize a bulk of two-sided objects. Uh, and you might find those in photo or document archives and might not be appropriate for feeder systems because they're more delicate or they require higher definition photos. Uh, we've been using that system to rapidly digitize a Dutch archive known as the RKD, 
And we photograph at a rate of 16,000 images per day with that conveyor. Uh, it actually can flip over the objects as they go through them. Uh, so it scans both sides. There are four cameras attached to that um, conveyor. And then last, we have our newest addition to our, um, to our conveyor trio, um, picture is entomology conveyor. So this system is currently under construction at a facility offsite from our European headquarters, but is planned for launch at the Berlin Natural History Museum later this year. Uh, this workflow that we'll use will, uh, will capture multiple angles of a single pinned insect, and it will also capture uh, all of the associated labels. We'll be able to process 5,000 specimens per day using our largest footprint configuration. Uh, and what I mean by that is most of our conveyors, um, mostly the herbarium and the entomology conveyor, they are built in a modular way. So we can actually decrease the size of the system if there's a not available space. Uh, you know, if we're working in, in a museum, sometimes there aren't rooms that are vacant, uh, that are large enough. So we'll have to change the actual size of the equipment that we're working with. So besides our conveyors, We've also designed a number of stationary systems that can digitize a wide variety of two-dimensional collections like postcards, uh, magazines, books, posters, and, and other flat or bound materials. Uh, one of our, uh, our, first, our first example here is a transparency set that's been used to digitize uh, 250,000 35 millimeter slides at Harvard University and fragile photo negatives for the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. A single person using this set can actually digitize more than 2,500 slides each day. Uh, so you can also digitize a, a, ver a fairly large collection in a short period of time. For bound collections, we've created uh, book cradles that can accommodate volumes that range from sturdy to fragile. So uh, our V-shaped set allows books with delicate spines to be digitized without opening them to 180 degrees while capturing each page as a single image. The other cradle features two separate tables uh, that together allow an open book to lie flat by carefully supporting the left and right book halves. Uh, these sets are perfect for things that you might find in a natural history collection like record books, ledgers, departmental libraries, and field notebooks. Uh, and then our last, our most versatile system is our tabletop. This is just a large flat table that features a removable glass plate. Our sets have a wide range of um, built-in features that allow us to make adjustments to change the capture area size, as well as resolution and lighting. Uh, on our tabletop, we've imaged millions of photographs, posters, blueprints, maps, archival documents, and even herbaria collections. With a throughput rate of 2,500 images per day, uh, we can take your collections into the digital realm safely, efficiently, and cost-effectively. Uh, and that brings us to object photography. So when we move into digitizing bulkier 3D objects, it's not always possible to use a conveyor or a table to get the best result. In those cases, traditional object photography is often the best choice. Over the years, we've had the opportunity to take part in these kinds of projects. Uh, one of our favorites being the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City where we coordinated a team of photographers to capture the museum's 200,000 3D objects. The collection ranged from furniture, ceramics, and appliances to jewelry, metalwork, and textiles. While these kinds of projects rely on different methods of digitization rather than pieces of equipment like our conveyor or tabletop, we can apply our efficient workflows learned over the course of 20 years to make the goal a reality. So, okay. Um, we've taken pictures of everything in your collection. We've already re reviewed image quality and everything looks good. But now how do you find or know uh, how to find things that are in your digital collection? During collection preparation and sometimes during digitization, we usually add barcodes to one or more items that we digitize. Um, for example, like I mentioned, the folders that contain your herbarium specimens and the herbarium specimens themselves. Uh, these unique barcodes create a digital hierarchy that will help us organize your files, so metadata, like transcribed label information, or anything that you might already have 
in a database that has a unique identifier uh, can be logically and easily attached to individual specimen records. Alongside imaging, we often transcribe the collections that we digitize both partially and completely. Uh, we can partner with dedicated transcription teams to rapidly keystroke the data from your collection, or we can implement your own crowdsourcing, uh, our own crowdsourcing platform, Heritage Helpers, uh, to help you engage directly with the public who can transcribe your labels according to instructions that you create. So now that we have uh, images and transcriptions, where is all of this data going to be stored? I think I might have skipped one. Yep. Um, some institutions already have collections management systems or data asset management systems that they've been using for years. Um, for those cases, we're well versed in transferring the files we've created for ingest into your database. Uh, but other times, a museum does not have a database infrastructure, or they're searching for new programs that provide specific features and flexibility that their current do not. Um, Pictura is a software company, and we feature a suite of programs dedicated to museum collections. Our main program is for collection and data management, uh, and that's called Memorix. It's used by hundreds of institutions in Western Europe, and we've featured and developed the software for more than 15 years. Um, originally designed for libraries and archives. Uh, this year, we're actually launching a new update and the, uh, the dams, which is customizable, will feature components for natural history collections. Uh, and the first that we're going to use this on is the USDA National Arboretum in um, Washington, DC. So that'll be the project that we're starting next month. Um, so that, that project will take course uh, over the course of one year and we'll digitize the 800,000 specimens they have. Um, we'll also build a website. We'll put all of their um, files into our collections management system and we'll host those files. So it's really the, the full digitization journey that we're talking about. So uh, after your data has been registered in Memorix, we can design a custom built website to showcase your collections online with an audience of your choosing. Uh, our team will match your institutional formatting and style to seamlessly work this component into your online presence. Uh, the images you see here are mock-up designs for an upcoming herbarium project where we'll create a website to showcase the collection. We can adapt web pages to include the content of your choosing, giving you full control over what data from your internal dams is visible and which is restricted. Uh, because sometimes there are pieces of information that you might not want to share. For example, um, orchid collections, you might not want to share the locality of those, but maybe you still want to share something about them. Um, the, the species name, the collector, uh, the date, and uh, that sort of information. And then on this slide, uh, you can see that specific features can also be integrated, such as a map showing the collection locations of different specimens that have no publication restrictions. You can also give your audience a clear window into data sets for your digital collection. Uh, now that we've covered a fairly broad view of picture as digitization journey, uh, I think Peter can give you some more examples of work that we've done over the last few years and uh, just give you a, a more full body experience with that. <laughs> All right, a few examples uh, just to go over and kind of show you our process or thought process, what we're able to handle um, and kind of what we think about when a new project comes in. Uh, so the first example, um, I've chosen um, a pretty straightforward project, I would say. Uh, we did a project for the Paul Mellon Center in the UK. And the Paul Mellon Center is a sister institution to the Yale Center for British Art, um, who we did another project with them uh, almost in tandem. Um, the Paul Mellon Center project yielded about 222,000 images of art reference mounts. These were photographic prints that were mounted on a backing paper. Uh, it's basically what you see on the left there. And it also has metadata typed out onto it. These mounts had information on the front, the back, Occasionally, they unfolded to display even more information. Um, and all of these mounts were held in accession folders, which were held in accessioned boxes. And I highlighted this example first because it introduces the concept of going beyond the digital image. 
uh, all sides of each mount were captured in a fairly straightforward manner. But of course, delivering a single batch of 222,000 images would be unwieldy and it would create a lot of extra work to sort through. Uh, you pretty much couldn't do anything with them right away. You can go to the next slide. So by increasing the scope of the project beyond digitization, we're able to deliver something much more useful. We're able to carry over housing hierarchy to our digital, digital directory. Uh, so we're preserving both folder and box level information. Uh, in addition, we broke up the type to metadata on each mount into fields that we're able to transcribe and deliver as data spreadsheets that also preserves this hierarchy. And this was done in a way to conform exactly to the Paul Mellon Center's collection management system so that they were able to deliver uh, or use what we delivered instantly and upload it to their collections management system. Uh, this workflow was also used for the uh, Yale Center for British Art, which was a collection of unmounted prints and that had the metadata on the back. Uh, that project yielded about 100,000 images and um, the, those folders were actually originally unaccessioned. So we worked with Yale uh, to accession uh, the folders and actually barcode them prior to digitization uh, so we once again could deliver clean data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so when delivering data, particularly transcribed data, we really value setting up a protocol. Collections, especially one that spans a large period of time, um, always have some sort of variance in the way things are written or labeled. Fields don't necessarily carry over from the oldest to newest object of the collection. Sometimes fields are added, sometimes fields are taken away. Uh, maybe older objects are appended with handwritten notes. Um, so these are the things we like to consider along with our clients uh, before we even begin digitization work or even sorting through any of the data. Uh, we like to have a clear and uh, as best we can unambiguous protocol set up. And of course, there's always gonna be exceptions. So we make sure that there's a strong line of communication between us and our clients so that when exceptions do come up, we know how to handle them. And um, uh, this is an example on screen of the Paul Mellon Center, um, a data sheet from that. Um, it looks very confusing and um, kind of almost unwieldy, but this is exactly what they're able to work with and import into their system. Um, and so it shows that we've thought this out and uh, along with the Paul Mellon Center and constructed a workflow that works for everybody and everybody's on the same page from our transcribers to their team importing the actual data. Um, so we've done several of these art reference projects, um, the largest being the one that Victor mentioned, uh, the RKD, uh, Netherlands Institute for Art History. And I, I'm not sure if he mentioned it, but it will be done this year, hopefully uh, with about 11 million images. Um, and so that's actually a good example of another project that's used our services for the digitization journey from start to finish. They're gonna be using our collection management and website services as well. Um, and even though that this type of imaging is more straightforward, it shows that when you put together a workflow that's efficient, you can heal, you can yield a, a huge volume uh, when you standardize it across a collection. 11 million is a pretty huge number. Uh, next slide. So yeah, this second example kind of illustrates how we can work with multiple different departments under a single institution and kind of find common ground between collections and establish a single integrated workflow. Um, in 2019, we digitized over 200,000 35 millimeter slides for the Harvard Fine Arts Library. We did that in about eight months and we set up on site at the Lamont Library at Harvard. Uh, the project was a bit more complex to start out. It required an on site setup, which means training local staff, setting up digitization equipment, bringing in IT infrastructure. Um, and also, uh, there was special attention paid to the actual materials themselves. Slide film that was glass mounted. Um, this was, they were mostly teaching slides. So they were frequently left out um, on desks where in another decade you can smoke in your office. So they were covered with uh, films of smoke and grime and uh, they were quite filthy. So every single slide needed to be cleaned uh, by hand. Uh, so the slides also typically go through an extra post-production workflow. Um, and that's pretty common when you're working with transmissive materials. Uh, in addition, these slides were already cataloged in uh, the JSTOR repository, but there was no link to the JSTOR ID. Uh, th there was nothing linking that ID to the accession of the objects. So we had to come up with a way to link these while we were digitizing. 
and we ended up achieving all this through a series of steps involving transcription uh, of the object IDs on the slide mounts, linking multiple inventories and, and scripting automated checks um, uh, so that if an error came up, we would be able to catch it, we'd be able to review it. And we worked with Harvard's imaging services, uh, which is part of their faculty of arts and sciences um, throughout this project. And we completed it so successfully that they kind of wanted to extend this project to the broader Harvard campus. And we ended up working with four additional departments, the Houghton Library, the Schlesinger Library, uh, Graduate School of Design and Dumbarton Oaks. And uh, we wanted to create a workflow that was equally as efficient and therefore cost effective for Harvard. So we have to come up with a single workflow that worked for each repository, all having slightly different wants and needs and ways in which their collection was structured. Um, so we ended up having to devise a largely automated workflow that consisted of individual independent steps um, kind of like what I'm illustrating on the left here. These were uh, the, these steps that we used um, to kind of have an all-encompassing project. Um, each Harvard collection was free to include all of these steps or some of these steps because uh, they were all kind of independent and able to um, be chosen or not chosen as they saw fit. So data uh, provided to us um, from these inventories, we were able to, to standardize in this way. Um, and you could go to the next slide. And this is kind of a, just an illustration of kind of what I'm talking about. You have different departments. Uh, the colored cubes kind of represent each step that was on the previous slide. And then one department might say, okay, I want all of these things. I want transcription. I want um, uh, post-processing. Uh, I want cropping of the slides. Another department might not choose to have some of these steps. They might not need some of these steps. Um, so they can kind of, if you think of it as a, uh, for some reason, I think of it as a train, uh, you can get off and get on the train whenever it's going to the same, uh, the same destination. Um, so it's pretty flexible in that way. And you can go to the next slide. All right, so uh, another example, and this comes from the world of, of natural history collections. Um, and it's a good example to, to to think through a, a workflow that doesn't really have a standard. Um, for art and historical collections, we tend to adapt to standards uh, uh, such as FAGI, uh, which if you don't know is the Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative. And these guidelines are immensely helpful um, as a cross-institutional cross benchmark for imaging guidelines. Uh, most institutions in the United States that are digitizing things that are on the left here in, included, um, use these guidelines. Um, there are no guidelines for isopods or uh, herbarium sheets or things like that or insects. Um, it's an entirely different field and uh, an entirely different way to interpret a digital image. Um, and I, I, the isopod, I love, it's not our image, I wish it was, but it always rem uh, reminds me of, of uh, the American Museum of Natural History, which I'm in New York. That was the museum I always went to as a kid and still go to. And if you've ever been there in their hall of biodiversity, they have, um, it's not an isopod, it's a lobster, I think, in a huge jar, gigantic specimen. And uh, I, I just love it. Um, so yeah, um, we were asked by the Field Museum to, to work on a special pilot, a small pilot that basically was us developing a method for digitizing paleobotany fields. And you could go to the next slide. And um, in case you don't know, I didn't know what these were, uh, but they're acetate sheets uh, on which a layer of fossil is, is peeled away using a chemical method. Um, and it's, it's a purely visual study, meaning the, the work associated with it. Um, and and the, uh, when you were studying these materials, you're looking at it visually as opposed to any other process such as chemical. Um, so we had to come up a way with a way that this was useful in research and we tried a number of different digitization methods. Um, the first of which was basically digitizing this as a, a uh, transmissive material. Uh, the sheets are very thin. They have kind of the same optical density as uh, a photographic emulsion. And um, transmissive process kind of mimics what you might see in some microscopy. So we decided to use a transmissive approach to this. Uh, and um, the, the, the results were actually visually quite spectacular. They were very nice and uh, 
the big problem with this is that while they were visually nice to someone like me, um, to a researcher, maybe they were not as, as useful. Um, uh, objects, of course, appear very different with reflected and transmitted light. The regions of interest in the peels, um, they, they take on a much less noticeable appearance when the light's transmitted. Um, and therefore, uh, while visually appealing, they, they couldn't be used for study. So uh, the best option was to get the capture using reflected light. Uh, these peels had undulations in them, they had specularity, um, and they were often quite large and long in shape. So we ended up using cross polarization to eliminate uh, any specular reflections from the acetate, as well as a glass plate to flatten the acetate. Um, in addition, we incorporated a, a, a stitching workflow, capturing the objects and in, in components and then stitching them together in a post-processing workflow. Uh, and this yielded images that were far more usable uh, for research. You can go to the next slide. So in reality, the, uh, this type of reflective workflow is, is pretty standard practice. However, it kind of emphasizes how much we re rely on and value working with you in the process, working with the museum, working with the institution. Uh, we want to create images and data that's useful for you. And, and we're flexible enough to build our workflows around what you are looking to achieve, not what we're what we think you're looking to achieve. Um, and, and no two projects are the same. I'm sure if two institutions had paleobotany peels, they might want different things out of it. So there's, there's no cookie cutter solution for, for anything really. Um, so we start projects with an assumption of adaptability, that, that we are adaptable and that we were gonna be the ones adapting to your needs. And uh, in any mass digitization workflow, um, concessions always have to be made to meet a deadline or a budget but we strive to work with you to make as few concessions as possible by making our workflow uh, as efficient as possible and, and geared towards what you're trying to uh, trying to do. Yep. Well, um, yeah, I think that that brings us back to um, just kind of we wanted to briefly go over maybe what it looks like for a herbarium project from start to finish. Just a quick run through of everything that we've just spoken about. So. Um, I did tell you about the digitization journey. There's pre-digitization, digitization, and then post-digitization. Um, and you can kind of break those down in a number of different ways. Uh, beforehand, I, I spoke to you about preparation, transportation, and installation of equipment. But uh, there are some important things that take place that aren't you know, necessarily part of those categories. Uh, and they might even happen prior to those. So um, here you can see there are five different steps for the pre-digitization phase uh, that I've just kind of identified that I think might be interesting for you. Uh, so one of the first things that you really need to do if you're going to have a digitization project is identifying your collections. Um, we need to really know the characteristics of your collections, you know, what they look like, what the size of those uh, objects are, um, if they're reflective, if they're transmissive, and then we also need to learn more about the volume of your, uh, your collection and just how many of those objects that you have. Uh, because one of the things that our, our workflows are based around are um, economies of scale. So by that, I mean, whenever you have more objects, um, it, there's more of a reason to create a standardized workflow that can be applied to multiple thousands, millions of objects. Um, when, when you do something like that, it really reduces the, the cost um, because the setup costs are quite marginal at, at that point. Um, but it, it really helps uh, establish a standardized workflow and that's where we start that process. Uh, once we have some of that idea, which uh, it will change over time until we actually start digitizing. But once we have some of that in mind, uh, you identify your goals. So you tell us what the end result of digitization is for you. What are the things that you are striving for? Um, and we can give examples that other institutions might be doing, but really, uh, you know, you're the one that is, is wanting this material to be digitized. So what do you want out of it? And then also the timeline. Um, there's usually restrictions on, on how much time you have to do something. So uh, in what period of time would this be ideal to do? Uh, after that, you can formulate a plan. 
um, that that takes place over the course of the project as well. But uh, your initial planning, your protocols that you want, uh, we can give you initial imaging protocols, handling protocols, transcription. Uh, and this is also a good moment to find out how you're going to get funding for the project, um, what kind of uh, bodies that you're going to work with to do uh, your, your funding search. Uh, then after all of that, once you do have your funding and we have some of these uh, important things, at least in the discussion, uh, you start preparing your collection. Uh, and what we want from that is for you to organize your specimens in a way that allows us to digitize them the most efficiently. Um, and of course, there are there's a, uh, that responsibility is shared. There are some things that you might do. There are some things that we might do uh, in order to make the collection um, ready for actual imaging. Uh, and that's the point where we figure that out. And one of those, one of the biggest things that we do is usually we'll add barcodes to one or more layers of your collection. So maybe the folders, um, maybe the specimens. And sometimes we don't even add a physical barcode. Sometimes it'll be a, a digital uh, barcode of sorts. And then um, you start your engine. You, we install our equipment and then we figure out the logistics of getting your collection from where it's being stored to where our uh, digitization equipment is. Uh, so after that, uh, you, we would unpack your collection uh, on our conveyor belt. So in this instance, if we're thinking about herbarium uh, collections, we will take the material, let's say it's stored in folders, we will put it on our conveyor and we'll actually take it apart. We'll take all of the specimens out of those folders and we'll arrange them in a way on our conveyor that uh, is possible for us to put them back together after we digitize in the exact same order that we received them. Uh, at this point, we might also add some barcodes to the specimens themselves so that they all have a unique identifier. And whenever we're actually creating that image, uh, the file name will be named using that barcode. And that will form the first um, searchable item, uh, first searchable thing that you can actually use to identify specimens in your collection. Uh, after that, we, we, once we're imaging the actual material, uh, at the end of our conveyor belt, there will be a person that is removing the material and putting it back together so it can be returned to storage. Uh, they're reviewing the image quality as they're taking the images. Um, after these steps, we would move on to transcription. So uh, if, if transcription is something that you need for your collection, sometimes uh, you might already have a lot of your collection transcribed and we would just need to link those uh, image files with the records that you already have or even a combination of that. Um, so we'll, we'll determine with you a protocol and we'll also determine if you're going to try to use crowdsourcing to transcribe your collection or you're going to use a dedicated team where uh, we would work with one of our partners that, that um, actually does the data entry by hand, uh, which is a much faster and more efficient uh, workflow, but it is more costly than using a crowdsourcing platform. Um, after all of this is done, you, uh, the client, the museum, you would uh, review the images, you would review the data entry, and you would validate them. So this is the phase when we've already set our protocols, you would take a look at those um, using a percentage check. So you might say, um, you might only check 2% of the material for certain qualities randomly. And if you find a certain level of error, then we would need to do some sort of rework. Uh, and then after that, we would prepare, to, uh, prepare for ingest. So we need to deliver all of these files to you. And it's either going to go into your database or it might go into our Memorix uh, collections management system where, uh, where the data will be organized. And to do that, we'll need to organize different scripts. Uh, and then once it is in um, our collections management system, uh, those files will be searchable. We will link together the images and the records. Um, there's also a step, you can also do uh, crowdsourcing at this stage too. So if you were to take the images and put them into our collections management system, our crowdsourcing platform can connect directly to the, the collections management system. So you already have the images in there with maybe some basic uh, metadata that helps you find them. And then you can enrich those files using heritage helpers, which would be connected. Uh, after that, you would uh, 
part part of the um, workflow with actually using our our collections management system Memorex. Uh, we store and host those files, uh, not the master files. You would be storing the master files for uh, for the long term, but we will store derivatives that we would be able to um, pass along using uh, Memorex. And that is done safely and securely on our servers. Um, and then we can also create a website for you where images from the collections management system will be posted online and you can control which things will be uh, visible there, which things will be restricted. Um, and that's, that's our goal is to help you unlock your museum, to digitize it, to show the world what you have for whatever reason you want. Uh, and I think, Peter, did you have anything to, to add to that? Or do we want to see if uh, anyone has any questions to start off? <laughs> uh, real quick, I just, I'll just say that, uh, um, you know, we're here to walk you th through some of the really non-glamorous parts of digitization as well. Like, you know, what file type are you using? Do you want JPEG 2000s, TIFFs, JPEGs? Uh, what color space you want it encoded in? Adobe RGB, ECI RGB? How much server space do you have? Is it going to be enough? Do we need to compress the files? Do we not compress the files? Uh, all these kind of technical details that um, sometimes we, we they, they get lost in the excitement of digitization, but we're here to, uh, to, to ground that and, and give you some help with that as well. Thank you so much, Victor and Peter, for a wonderful talk. It sounds really cool project. Uh, uh, process <laughs> and we already have a couple of questions in the chat so i'm going to read through one is coming from the california academy citizen science department i think um, and this person say could you please describe your workflow for georeferencing biological specimens if you have one including its speed and accuracy this is fantastic thank you so uh for for doing that sort of work we don't have our own workflow per se um so our, our collections management system has the ability to record that sort of information after transcription. And we can use that to create um, maps like I, I showed earlier in a slide. Um, a workflow for that, I, I don't really think we have that per se, but um, we do transcribe all of this type of data from labels, either using dedicated teams or crowdsourcing, and it can be formatted uh, in, in a logical way so that you can use it together um, to, to make these sorts of graphs or maps. Okay, thank you. We have another question from Ryan and it says, have you worked with Son Sonyverse on any citizen science project? I think it's Sonyverse. Uh, yeah, I've, I've heard of those. Um, we have not. so. A lot of the um, a lot of the work that we do, we will do crowdsourcing through our platform Heritage Helpers. But some of our um, clients that we have, some museums that we work with, they do interact with those on their own. But it's an outside workflow from us. So um, we do often contribute to different um, data sets that might make their way into. Um, different platforms, maybe different transcription platforms. Uh, I know that some of those that are used by the National Science Foundation, they can share data between different institutions. And while you're transcribing, you can um, actually uh, decide to copy over data from another record that someone else has transcribed and it has the same collector name or it's part of the same collection. Um, we, I, I don't know of any interaction specifically, um, but I know that we work for uh, the Mysa Botanic Garden and they have a program called DoDat for, uh, it's their own platform for transcribing. Uh, and I think that there is a connection that we have with them, uh, but I, I'm not familiar with that. I think my European um, colleagues would be better suited to answer that. <laughs> Right, we have another question from Rebecca Johnson, and she said, um, I wonder how Memorix works for existing specimen databases. Can the data be piped into our databases? 
So data with, with Memorix, uh, it's possible to import and export the data, of course. Um, but we do have the ability, uh, one, one of the things that we're updating with Memorix is um, using linked data. So we're actually able to link to, um, you know, if we're, if we're working with the RKD, this is what we've done for their website and with Memorix. Uh, and um, you can connect to authorities that you trust, lists of information that will be integrated into the collections management system. Uh, and this is most visible on the website because where we'll show you the collection records, you can click on different pieces of information about that record. And it's sort of like a, a rabbit hole. It will keep leading you to something else, another type of linked data. Um, it forms lots of different associations, but in regards to how it works with other databases, if you're, if you're connecting Memorix, um, our collections management, to another database, I'm not sure how it would be pulled out or it would be pulled in, but we, we do have the ability to connect to different lists and create uh, lookup lists, for example. So maybe you want to uh, create a list of all of the taxonomy that Tropicos has uh, for botanical names we can actually connect to that and have lookup lists in uh, the collections management system where you can pull those names. Thank you, Victor. Uh, we have lots of questions today. Uh, this is another one from Chrissy uh, Petrosky. She says, any ideas for capturing label data from labels in convex glass jars or vials? We have both lead fluid preserve and dry specimens that will likely not be removed during massive digitization of labeled data. Did you want to comment on that, Peter? Sure, yeah. Um, so there's a number of different methods that we have experimented with. Uh, I'm not sure that we've actually taken on a large scale collection um, that has warranted deciding on one of these few methods, um, but we've experimented with things such as using mirrors um, and stitching things together uh, and also kind of um, using a scanning sensor uh, in, in combination with rotating a, a vial or, or a glass jar uh, that can kind of piece together the label in a rectilinear way. Uh, it's one of those good examples though, where um, if a project is presented to us, uh, that's when we kind of really um, focus on that particular R&D, um, because one institution might prefer it one way, one might prefer it another way. Uh, so it's it's kind of, is this image usable for you? Does it work for you? Or would you prefer it in, in a different way? And that's that's kind of like what we like to play around with with, with our R&D. Yeah, and I, I think the, um, the testing that we've done has been specifically for labels that are visible from the outside of the jar. So I know that sometimes labels will be in there that fall down and they're flat on the bottom and there might be something on top of them. In those cases, I think it might be a little bit challenging uh, because there probably would need to be some sort of manipulation unless you could capture it from the bottom. Um, but yeah, I think the, the test that we've done has been, if there's a label kind of inside, it's pressed against the jar so you can read it from the outside or, or even a label that's on the outside of the jar. Um, using a, a forms of rotation, uh, we, can, we can make captures of those so that you can read the information. Awesome. There's another question from Brian Fisher, and he says, how does your herbarium imaging workflow differ from other companies such as the one that imaged the specimens at the Paris Museum? So uh, the Paris Museum, the, the Paris Natural History Museum, they digitized their entire collection using uh, different types of, uh, a different conveyor system uh, that was a, a bit more complex than ours. Um, ours is just a straight conveyor that has two or three people that work on it at a time. Uh, there's a person that will work, uh, we, we call them positions one, two, and three, or sometimes one and two. Um, there's a person that stands at the beginning that will disassemble the collection. Then there's someone across from them that will uh, place the material and place a barcode 
And then at the end, there's someone that's watching uh, as we're taking photographs. So um, maybe, Peter, you could talk about a, little, a few of the steps as you're digitizing what the software actually does. Um, but yeah, I think that's where a lot of our, our differences might be. Yeah, uh, I can't speak for that project in particular because I don't know what uh, workflow they used, but I can say that um, one of the things that we like to do is, is we like to put some sort of automated validation uh, in our software so that nothing can really go through the conveyor that will cause issues later on. Um, and that might include a validation for a barcode. Uh, did they, does, does it, our website, or, sorry, our software will automatically search for a barcode. Uh, is that barcode valid? Does it match the number of characters it's supposed to match? Does it match the form it's supposed to match? Uh, is it readable? Um, and we'll do another validation for image quality uh, where we'll measure such specifications as uh, uh, what they call sampling efficiency, which, which analyzes uh, a slanted edge, uh, creates a, what's called a spatial frequency response map, and then it will calculate how efficiently we're sampling uh, at a certain resolution. Um, and then we'll do a, a color encoding error, which is basically a color check, do the colors look right? Uh, and that target is actually also for our projects included with every image. Um, many institutions will also include a target, but we actually run that validation every time a specimen is passed underneath the camera uh, and imported into our software. Uh, and our, the conveyor will actually stop if there's a problem. So um, it's not like someone needs to be reading these numbers and evaluating these numbers. It will just stop. Uh, and then, you know, you go back a specimen and then reshoot it. Um, so we, we like to have these automated checks in place uh, in addition to some other automation such as uh, automated cropping and things like that. So you don't have to worry about these things later on in, in the digit, uh, post digitization process. Yeah, and it, our, um, our software does have the ability to read multiple types of barcodes even at the same time. So we can read um, more than a single barcode. And one of the barcodes could be a data matrix. One of them could be a uh, like a 39 barcode. Uh, and then there are many different checks that do go on with the, with the software itself. Um, the conveyor has a reverse feature. So as we're scanning, if there is an error, uh, it will stop the conveyor, as Peter said, and multiple specimens will need to be reshot. Usually it's only like three or four specimens, but we don't actually have to handle those specimens usually. We just can send the conveyor back uh, and then it will come forward because the conveyor itself has um, about two dozen, a dozen to two dozen spots where we place specimens at a time. So we can just shift it back and forth uh, without a lot of hassle. Thank you. It sounds like a really, like um, I guess the auto automatization of the process is really like, put everything in a high standard, right? Um, Athena Lam also is asking an important question about manipulation of specimens. How does it capture label data that are stuck and may be obstructed by an insect specimen, for example? Do we have to take the specimen of the insect pin? So for, for pinned insects, uh, the, the insect stays on the pin the entire time. What we do is we remove all of the labels that are on there. Um, so I don't really have any diagrams in my presentation because this, um, the, the equipment that's being built, there are probably going to be some modifications before it's actually fully constructed. But um, by mid-year, we are going to actually launch the conveyor. So we should have some more of those diagrams soon. But we, we will take, um, essentially what we have is a drawer filled with entomology specimens. Uh, we take a picture of that drawer, um, not, not a really for visual purposes, but um, it can be for visual purposes, to, to show you where every single specimen is located in that drawer. And every time you remove a specimen, it takes a picture. So when they come back to, um, after they're digitized, they can be put back in the exact same spots once they're completed. Um, Besides that, once we take the pins out, we kind of put them on a little pedestal. Uh, and before that, we will remove all of the uh, labels using, uh, it's just a little tool that we use. Um, I think it's, it's a similar concept. I've seen it before with, with entomology collections. It's sort of like, um, it looks like a little staircase that's made out of 
metal to put different labels on. Um, we will just take all of them off one by one. We'll put them across a platform. And during digitization, it will capture one side and then it will actually, using a vacuum, flip over the labels. We'll take a picture of the other side in case there's information there. And then at the end, um, we actually project light from underneath so you can see where all of the holes are. And then we take the, um, the pinned insect and place all of them back on. And then we put it back in the collection. I think, does that answer your question, Athena? I don't know if you're still there. Because I think, yeah, I think it, well, I imagine, yes. Because I, I think she was just like saying when there are m multiple specimens or labels. Usually there's multiple labels per pin. If there are mm -hmm. multiple specimens per pin, yeah. um, I'm not sure I, that probably we probably don't remove those. Those might be exceptions, one of the irregularities um, that you might find throughout the collection. But uh, I'm not sure if that's the question. <laughs> yeah, well, she say, I'm sure, yeah. She say yes, that, um, thank you. <laughs> All right, and is, if there, is there any other question in our uh, audience? Oh, it was a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much for uh, um, accepting our invitation. And before everyone leaves, I just want to remind everyone that next week we'll have another seminar at the same time um, in the same place. <laughs> and next week we will have uh, Dr. Rebecca Vega Torber, which will be hosted by one of our master's students, Morgan Farrell. So please tune on. And again, Victor and Peter, thank you so much for uh, explaining us this break, it really has some potential. And I, I'm sure everyone is, well, there's a lot of comments. If you are in the chat, you can see everyone is really um, happy to hear about you. Whoa, wait, there's, I think another question I have from Ryan. I have, have you worked with anyone who has used your digitized imagery as the basis of photogrammetry or other 3D reconstructions? That's an interesting one. Uh, we have not done photogrammetry work, um, but I'll say it's not outside of our capabilities. Okay. Because I was also thinking about it, like in our lab, we're also working with photogrammetry and reconstructing um, well, reef corals in general, but I guess that's, Ryan, is that, because yeah, I think that's. Yeah, I don't oh. think, I don't, I don't know of anyone that's used it for that purposes either. Um, one thing that I know that some of our images have been used for, um, the Smithsonian actually processed uh, a lot of the images we created for their ferns. I think it was for maybe lycophytes and selaginella. Uh, I think that they ran an, uh, an image test. They wanted to see if they could identify the specimens to at least the family level. And it worked with, uh, I believe it was 94 or 95% accuracy using the images uh, just to identify to the family level. So um, that's, I guess, one example of something that images have been used for for, for research, but uh, yeah, not photogrammetry. <laughs> yeah, but I guess once you have that information, like it could expand in multiple ways. Thank no, you very much. Many options. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you so much to both of you for coming remotely. <laughs>